Good evening, South Bay family. We are thankful for our Connect Group series, The Bait of Satan. And we see that every week we're hearing reports of how God is using this series to speak to people within our church, our church community, young and old, and how they are being blessed by the lessons and really, really being set free from the traps, the trap of offense. And uh, this has been a blessing. One of the quotes from uh, the author of the book, John Bevere, he says, we are to be so far removed from avenging ourselves that we willingly risk being taken advantage of again. And, and just another powerful quote on how we continue to grow from, from this. And uh, it's just so timely. We're, we're thankful. To review, we learned in the previous lessons that we must be have a sure foundation as we grow in our walk with God to be mature Christians. We learn that trials and tests, they really, um, they, they find us and they build us and they show us where we can grow and how we can stay in true maturity as a child of God. We've learned that we can be liberated and that we we're not just liberated for ourselves, but we're liberty, liberated to serve one another uh, and even serve the kingdom of God. And that's, that's awesome. We learn that it's not about us, but rather as servants, we choose to lay down our rights and seek to edify our brothers and sisters who may not be able to handle all that we can handle, but we're here to serve them, not with pride, but with a servant's heart and a spirit of servanthood. And tonight we're going to deal with escaping the trap and pursuing reconciliation with our brothers and sisters. And these, this lesson comes from chapters 12 and 13 in our book, The Bait of Satan. Pastor Hodges, thank you so much for uh, sharing and for teaching us how to overcome this. Would you uh, take it away as we go into lesson number seven? Can you believe it? Seven already. Lesson number seven on The Bait of Satan. Welcome again, everyone. And so tonight we're going to deal, first of all, with escaping the trap. Uh, my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Acts, chapter 24, verse 16, we'll begin there. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's such a powerful verse. I love the fact that it comes in the book of Acts. It's still the you know, birthplace of the church. The new birth experience is still fresh. And this is how we, how we overcome after we are born again to exercise. It's going to take a little work, a little effort to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So what we learn from this is it's going to take effort to stay free from offense. It just doesn't happen automatically, accidentally. It happens with intent. We have to intentionally exercise, exercise. You think about exercise, how does exercise profit you or when will it profit you? If you do it daily, it will profit you. If you exercise once a year, it's probably not doing a whole lot of good. And so it is. We've got to exercise our conscience every day to keep it void of offense towards God and towards men. Uh, you know, the Greek word for exercise in this scripture is a scale. And Vine's Expository Dictionary defines it as to take pains, endeavor, exercise by training or discipline. And didn't Jesus call us to be disciples? That takes discipline. You know, sometimes others will offend us and it's not hard to forgive when the offense comes. We've exercised our hearts so that they're in condition to handle the offense. So no injury, no permanent damage results. We're really not offended. Offended is when I harbor that offense, I hold on to it, I make it part of my, my personality and my thoughts and, 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 and schemes for, for future. <laughs> you know, some offenses are going to be more challenging than those for which we've been trained. And this extra strain may cause a wound or an injury, after which we'll have to exercise spiritually, kind of go through rehab <laughs> to be free and to be healed again. But the result is always worth the effort. Our degree of maturity determines how well we handle an offense without injury or without becoming offended. Tonight, we're going to address some of these extreme intense offenses that require more effort to resolve. Now, the first step to healing and freedom is to recognize that you are hurt. You know, often pride does not want us to admit 
that we are hurt or that we are offended. But once you admit your true condition, you open yourself up to God's correction. Just like recovering from a physical injury, we must exercise ourselves to strengthen our hearts, minds, and emotions to prevent future injuries. What about relapses? Well, you see the person that hurt you and immediately there's a discomfort. There's maybe even an anger or a contempt or even bitterness. It's very deep and very severe. When you feel these feelings or have these thoughts, you try and reject them and cast them down like Paul said. You're trying to exercise as you strive to be free from the offenses. But how do you keep these thoughts from drawing you back into unforgiveness? God desires a higher level of freedom from you and for us. You don't have to, if you don't want to, live the rest of your life holding the offenders at arm's length from you. The Lord's instruction is to pray for those who've hurt you. In Matthew 5, 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You pray for them. That's number one. You pray out of obligation. You may add prayers like, Lord, bless them. Give them a good day. Help them. But if you seem to be getting nowhere in your walk with God, in your forgiveness of that person, in your reconciliation with them, then you might need to put on some eye salve and open your eyes to your condition. Here's what it says in Psalm 35, 11 and 12. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. You might feel like this in your situation, that every time you try to do good for that person and every time you try to reconcile with them, that you are given back evil in return for your efforts. It could be their words. It could be their actions. It could be just their demeanor, their expressions. Something just always seems to go wrong. You feel like you can identify with David. Your soul is in sorrow. But God wants to point something out to you tonight through this scripture. Look at the next verse, Psalm 35, verse 13 and 14. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. These men were trying to destroy him. They returned evil for his good. Now notice, David's response was not based on the actions of others. That's so important. He determined to do what was right, period. He prayed for them as if they were his close brothers or as though he was grieving the loss of his mother. It's so important that we posture ourselves in the right attitude and frame of mind. Could it be that God would show you how you ought to pray for those who have hurt, abused, and offended you? Could God be challenging you to pray the very things for him that you want God to do for you? Remember that golden rule again, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but we've made it even more personal and powerful, do unto others as you would have God do unto you. You know, your prayers can change where it's no longer God bless them and give them a good day, but your prayer becomes infused with life, like Lord, reveal yourself to them in a greater way. Bless them with a closeness of your presence. Help them to know you more intimately. May they be pleasing to you and bring honor to your name. Become more like you. Now, does that sound like a prayer that you would want to pray for God to do in your own life? Well, absolutely. You can go from praying for them for their sake or for your sake to praying for them for their sake. Move from praying for your sake to praying for their sake truly. There's healing in confrontation. Discomfort still remains. You fight the urge to be critical. You fight within yourself to go to them, but rather you tell yourself, you're fine now, you've forgiven. But I believe the Holy Ghost is telling his people that we need to find healing 
in our confrontation. God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. And confrontation is an opportunity for reconciliation. When we think of the word confrontation in today's terms, we probably think of it in negative terms. We're not using it that way here. We're using it in a positive way. Confrontation in order to facilitate reconciliation. So here's how you do this. Humble yourself, confess your own wrong attitude, and ask for their forgiveness. You say, what if they don't forgive? Well, that's on them. But you must do what you can with a humble spirit. Reconciliation, forgiveness, and healing can flow like a river. Even in those places that brick walls have been put up, the rivers of life can flow again. But that healing is going to come from a confrontation that facilitates a reconciliation. I'm reminded of Jacob as he wrestled with the angel. And this is the night before his confrontation with his brother Esau. Jacob had tricked Esau for his birthright and he stole his blessing from their father. It had been years since they had even laid eyes on each other. And Jacob is now one night from seeing the brother that he had wronged so badly. Now notice it was on this night that the heel grabber, the supplanter's name was changed. It was now Israel, meaning a prince of God, or may God prevail, would become the name of God's great nation. When you are done wrestling, God wants you to change your name, your past, your history, from all that it represents, and give you a new name, and give you a new walk. So the very next day, they begin their journey to this confrontation with Esau. This story is told in Genesis chapter 33. Let's look at verses one through four. It says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. He wasn't alone. And Jacob divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. You know, there is healing in humble confrontation. When you first knew the person that hurt you or offended you, you could love them because they had not wronged you. But when you were hurt, it became difficult then to love them. And as you go through the restoration process, God works healing in your life. You can love them again with the same intensity as when you first met them. That is possible. In spite of their faults, it's a mature love that we must have. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4 and 8, And above all things, have fervent Charity, which is the Bible word for the purest love there is. We know charity today means giving with no thought of return. When you give to charity, Goodwill, Salvation Army, what have you, your church, you don't expect that back. You give it away. That's pure love, giving with no thought of return. But Peter here says, above all things, have fervent charity. Fervent, that's a strong word, among yourselves. Practice this fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Love always involves giving. So charity equals love, which equals agape. We've talked about that, which means unconditional love. It's a God love. Only God really purely can love unconditionally. And when we get God, we can love unconditionally as well. You know, it's easy to love those who haven't hurt us, or it's easy to love those who can do no wrong in our eyes. But that's an immature love. When we were teenagers, maybe that was called puppy love. <laughs> but it's another thing to love someone when we can see their faults. That's called marital love. <laughs> when you've been married for years, and especially though, if you've been the victim of those faults. And when similar tests or snares of offense come up, it won't take any time for you to release these things. Why? Because you've got a mature love. You've exercised your heart to stay strong and free from offense. And that's really the key to a successful marriage. My wife and I have now been married 
45 years and I can truly tell you it gets better. 45 years is better than it was at 35 and it's better than it was at 25 and better than it was at 15. That might be unbelievable to you, but that's actually the truth. Let me tell you one of the reasons why though, it's what we just said here, that our love has matured and it's matured to the point we're not gonna allow the faults of the other person to change our heart. We're gonna keep loving fervently, fervent charity, giving this love. It's maturing through hardship and it helps us to exercise our heart so we can stay strong and free from offense. You know, we grow in the tough times. Have we had tough times? Absolutely, we've had tough times. But that's when we grow. We really don't grow during the easy times. We grow during the tough times. Hard places will always come in our journey with the Lord. That's something a new believer, maybe they have a hard time accepting that initially. They're thinking, I'm changed, I'm born again, no more problems in life. There are gonna be still some problems and difficulties. We, we can't escape them but we need to face them because they're part of the process of being perfected in Christ. If you choose to run from hard times, hard situations, you'll seriously hinder your growth. But as you overcome different obstacles and challenges, you become stronger and you become more compassionate. You'll fall more in love with Jesus. If you've come out of hardships, and don't feel this way, you've probably not recovered from the offense. Recovery is a choice, and it's your choice. You know, some people get hurt, and they never recover, but that is their choice. As cruel as this may sound, they chose that path. Maturity doesn't come easily. If it did, everybody would be mature already, <laughs> but few actually reach this level of life because of the resistance they face and how they resist change themselves. There's resistance because the course of our society is not godly, it's, it's selfish. We're surrounded by this world. Remember in Acts 2, right after uh, verse 38, right after the promise to our children, there was an admonition and save yourselves from this untoward generation. We're living in that generation, the untoward generation. We've got to save ourselves from this world, its thinking, its culture, its ways, everything about this world is going farther and farther from God. Our world is not godly, it's a selfish world. And so as a result, to enter into the maturity of Christ, there's gonna be hardships that come from standing against the flow of selfishness. Paul returned to three cities where he birthed churches. His purpose was to strengthen the souls of the disciples in those churches in those cities. However, it's interesting to see how he strengthens them. He encourages them by exhorting them to continue in the faith. And he says, quote, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. That's in Acts 14, 21 and 22. It's through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. We don't usually think of it that way. We think of the kingdom of God as streets of gold, walls of jasper, seas of crystal, everything's beautiful and wonderful, lovely rainbow, but the scripture actually says it's through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. Remember what the gates of the holy city are made of? Pearls. How are pearls made? <laughs> they are made through irritations that become offenses. And that oyster has to learn to deal with that. And he coats it with what we would say, love and charity, okay? And creates a pearl. And that's what the gates of heaven are. They are one solid giant pearl in each of those gates. So Jesus did not promise us a life of ease. He did not promise success according to this world's standards. He showed that if we're going to finish our course with joy, that we're going to meet up with resistance. And Paul the Apostle calls it tribulation. If you're rowing on a river against the current, you'll have to row continuously just in order to maintain, let alone progress, against the flow of the river. Because if you stop rowing and you relax, you're gonna be flowing with the current. And even so, when we are determined to go God's way, we'll meet up with many tribulations. Trials will all show the answer to one main question. Are you going to look out for yourself like the world does? Or are you going to live a self-denied 
life. Remember what Jesus said, if you want to be his disciple, what's the first thing you do? Deny yourself. Peter put it so well. He said, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. That's 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Now notice here he compares the extent of suffering to the extent of rejoicing. That is important. When you are going through the hardest trial and situation of your life, just think about this. When you overcome that and come through it, there is the commensurate reward waiting for you on the other side. That may be a little help and motivation to keep you going. So don't look at the offense. How can you rejoice to this great extent? Well, when his glory is revealed, you will be glorified with him. And this glory is to the degree that you allow him to perfect his character within you. Look at the coming glory. Now, next week, we're going to look at reconciliation. But for tonight, we're going to go over our declarations as we learn to escape the trap. Again, I hope these lessons are benefiting you. They are so valuable to me. And the Lord wants to use this to help all of us to heal us, to better us, to mature us. And these declarations are very important. As, as our executive pastor reads these declarations, I pray you'll make them your own. These are things to pray to God these are things to speak and say out loud. There's a power in our words. The Bible says the power of life and death is in our words and healing is in our tongue. And so speak these declarations. Speak not as you are or were, but speak as you are going to be with the grace of God. So God bless you, Pastor Model. If you would now share the summation here and, and the declarations for this lesson. Absolutely. Thank you, Pastor Hodges, for this wonderful lesson. And reading these declarations... These will come from chapter number 12 in our book, The Bait of Satan. We're going to read these together. God, I declare, I will not like the world who seeks to avenge itself for every wrong, but I will instead be forgiving and loving, recognizing you as our only righteous judge. Because of the miraculous forgiveness of God, I declare that in his power, I will be kind one to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave me, Ephesians 4, 32. God, I will not ignore your conviction as you speak through my conscience. I am open to your correction, and I long to grow to be more like you. Now, looking at some declarations from chapter number 13, we're going to read these together. I declare that I will exercise myself spiritually, that I may always have a conscious void of offense towards the Lord and towards others. From Acts chapter 24, verse number 16. I am determined to daily exercise my spirit, that I may strengthen my heart, mind, and emotions, so that I will not be so vulnerable to hurt others. And lastly, there's many others, but these are great. We're, these, this last one we're going to do together. It's this, I am determined to go God's way when I meet up with life's tribulations. The trials of my life will teach me to live a self-denied life and to receive the blessings of God. Wow, what powerful declarations that you can say to yourself, to one another, with your family, friends, and in your time of prayer. Would you take a moment right now in your group and share, talk, discuss, have a time of prayer as we grow and how to overcome the, you know, this uh, trap of offense and escaping the trap. And, and we're going to go next week and look at how we can reconcile one with another. Thank you so much for being part of our Connect Group series. Thank you for being part of our church. We can grow, and it's amazing when we can grow together. May God bless you. Let's continue to love God, love one another, and let's continue to love lost souls. We'll see you this Sunday for Revival and next week for Connect Group. God bless you, church family.